from Silicon Valley, the heart of startup land. It's Getting to Alpha, the show about creating innovative, compelling experiences that people love. And now, here's your host, game designer, entrepreneur, and startup coach, Amy Jo Kim. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Today, my guest is one of the most inspiring designers I've ever met. Aaron Hoffman is a game designer and fantasy novelist with a passion for social activism and projects with a purpose. She's currently lead game designer at Glass Labs, a Gates Foundation initiative where she creates assessment-based learning games. Aaron has deep insights into the nature of games and learning and powerful ideas about how game design can impact the world. A game can stay one step ahead of a player and pull something out that's responding to feedback that they've put into the system and say, hey, you've been doing this series of actions. What about this action that might be just outside of your comfort zone but might uh, lead you to make a leap forward? I learned so much from our conversation. I know you will too. So thank you, Aaron, for joining us for the Getting to Alpha podcast. Sure, happy to be here. So Aaron, give us a whirlwind tour of your background. How did you get started and what were the key experiences along the way that shaped your point of view? Yeah, um, so I, I think I'm part of the trailing edge of game developers who got into game design by accident. I don't, I don't think that that happens as much anymore, but what happened with me was um, I had created a little online writing group when I was about 15 years old on America Online and started doing some game design actually as a way of balancing the social community to make sure that people that were exchanging stories weren't getting out of control with how powerful their characters were, which was starting to happen. So I started creating rule sets, which then led to a friend introducing me to this online text-based game, which led to me playing a lot of that game, which led to signing up to be a developer on it. So um, I actually did that throughout college without realizing at all that I was building any kind of job skill. Wow. (laughs) And then what happened? Uh, Well, then I got a scholarship to the uh, Game Developers Conference because of that work, uh, mostly, I think. I, you know, I was in college actually studying 3D animation, and um, I, I was going to go into a PhD program in philosophy, but went to the GDC, really found like, uh, felt like I had met my people there and, and got a job offer, so I started in QA and moved uh, into design pretty shortly after that. Wow. So have you always had an interest in weaving together narrative with games? You know, uh, for the longest time, I really felt like they were separate interests that I had. Uh, but I am now that I feel like I have built enough skill in each of them independently. I'm starting to sort of braid them together. So that's changed for me over the years. Uh, I really, in game design, am drawn to systems and uh, rules and balancing and and mechanics. Uh, and so that kind of had been the forefront of my interest in game design. But now I'm finding more and more ways to be a bit more fluid about those systems, which then bring in more narrative work. That's really interesting. I know you've also been a public speaker and an advocate for change in the industry. What first prompted you to speak up and start sharing that publicly? You know, um, I blame my dad for a lot of this because um, he he is a very sort of old school civic engagement Democrat who believes that uh, it's necessary to be a good citizen to think critically about um, the government that you live in and the world that you live in and to express yourself in a convincing way with with rigorous argument and and, and so for me you know I people mostly know about the EA spouse thing which was this venting blog post that I, I wrote um, about you know that, that was formulated as an argument because that was kind of how how I knew to express myself if you wanted to convince people of something um, but I had written letters to the editor when I was in high school that resulted in, you know, notoriety and things like that. So it, it goes back for me um, a long way. And mostly I feel like I will start to see something that I think is unjust or not right. And again, from that position of being a good citizen and t- taking ownership for the systems that we live in, uh, feeling like I had to say something. And then once I've said something, then people say, well, then what should we do? And then I wind up speaking publicly about them. So these days, what topics are you most passionate about sharing? Oh, gosh. Uh, in, in terms of that sort of civic engagement and looking at our own systems? Everything. Also in terms of game design and your own work. What, I mean, you're, a, you're somebody who I would like people to go and 
you know, listen to and follow up on after this interview. <laughs> so um, right. I'm just really interested these days where your passion is and that, that you care about sharing in the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm still, I've been in education for the past two and a half years, and I'm still a true believer. I haven't burned out on that yet. Um, and I really think that there is a crisis in education in the United States, and it's very complex, and the system is very big, so it's really hard to know. There's so many different perspectives. Uh, but I believe that the role of games in that is actually um, a kind of sacred role that games have always had, which is that without the player, there is no game. And so I think that in these in the large system of education, it came to be viewed as this factory system that was producing citizens, which is fine, but when the attention is on the system itself, it's less on the, the individual learner and on the humanity of the person that's moving through it. And so you had these scalable teaching practices, which they, you know, they now call it sage on a stage, where you've got a teacher standing at the front of the classroom just talking at the kids. And uh, mainly uh, the role had become quite, um, quite custodial and the value of it was how many kids can we put in that classroom you know, in order to reach as many of them as possible, which began as a noble goal. But what it does is um, ultimately disempower the learner. So what a game does is it's it's one on one, one game to one player usually, and even if it's many players to, to many players, they're uh, still interacting through the game itself, and that game is responding to them. You know, as we say, sixty frames a second. You know, so all of the attention is put on that person themselves. And I think this is a transformation for the way that learning can be done. So what I want is for game designers and people who have a game design inclination to start thinking about how the systems that they make in software are responding to the humanity of the player that they encounter, which I think that they inevitably do. It's just that we don't really sort of um, become metacognitive about this and think about what it means. But in learning, it means that a game can stay one step ahead of a player and pull something out that's responding to feedback that they've put into the system and say, hey, you've been doing this series of a actions. What about this action that might be just outside of your comfort zone but might uh, lead you to make a leap forward? And so I think that game designers have a tremendous amount of potential that is um, untapped to, to really change learning. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I, I, I have to like temper back my my passion for it actually because I've, I've become such a deep believer in this and in like the unexplored frontier of games that we can potentially make to address a lot of these things. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> cool. And we should talk about that more another time. Um, yeah, yeah, your background in, in neuroscience, right? Which is just also is beginning to fuse together with this world. Absolutely. And uh, at Shuffle Brain, we've done a lot of work with educational gaming over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And I just, I could not agree more. And the time is now. So yep, thank you. Thank you for your rant. It was <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, so you've also, Erin, um, been at quite a few companies. Uh, you said originally as a QA person, but then as a designer, in particular a system designer and, you know, overall game designer. So what are some common mistakes that you see first-time creators, students or, you know, new people that come into companies you work at? What are some of those mistakes you see these first-time creators make in the early stages when they're designing and testing their game ideas? Oh, yeah. Um, the most common is to do too much work before you put something in front of a player uh, by far. And so um, what, what I often see, especially from younger designers, is basically if you're creating, as a young designer, if you're creating a game design document that is longer than five pages, you're probably already on the wrong track. And so um, that's, that's what I would say to people who are kind of just starting out is don't do too much forward thinking or forward development. And even if you're working in software, to kind of get too attached to uh, the assets that you're putting into the game before you're seeing the basic interactions of how players um, are relating to your game. You have to get it in front of players as soon as you absolutely can. And you have to know that it's going to be terrifying and horrible. And then you have to know how to look at their interactions with this very, uh, you know, nascent piece of software and understand where the promising interactions are and what needs to be changed about it. Awesome. So when you have an, a new project and you've been in that situation quite often, 
How do you approach early testing and iteration on a project yourself? How do you decide which ideas to pursue and which to filter out? Talk us through your process. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I can tell you from an education standpoint, I can tell you separately sort of my, myself personally as, as an artist. How, how would you pro- – which so one do you prefer? So let's, let's do both because I think the difference will be very illuminating. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, from an educational perspective, we at, at Glass Lab, we actually have a really rigorous process. We, we decide what kind of game to make. Uh, and that has to do with what is not present in uh, the market, which it actually is huge because, to be frank, there's just not very many really good educational games out there. And so we have a lot of possibility. So we, we say, okay, what is something that is not already covered by a great game? So, for instance, we're not going to do fractions because sliced fractions is great. We're going to stay out of the path of stuff that we think really works. Uh, and then we're going to talk to teachers and ask them what they're struggling to teach in classrooms. And that usually helps us triangulate towards a competency that is very dynamic. So for instance, we recently made a game about ratios. And the complicated thing about ratios is that it has to do with change over time. And when you have something that has to do with change over time, it's hard to capture conceptually in a fixed medium like paper. And a lot easier if you have something that you can actually see an animated system that's going to evolve over time. And you want to put in front of the player multiple systems that evolve over time and say, look at these two completely different things, but this is what they have in common, is this idea of a ratio that is fixed between them. And and then we want to contextualize what a ratio is. So we also want to say... We're only going to pick something to work on that we think if a kid understands this, it's going to change their life. So we really believed in that uh, with regard to argumentation with Mars Generation 1, that if you know how to argue, it's a way of projecting your power into the world in a way that convinces people that you're someone worth listening to. And it enhances your relationships and enhances your ability to think critically. So we also uh, are just thinking about like from ourselves and from our hearts, I guess this is more artistic, um, what do we want to see in the world? How do we want it to change? What tools? Do we want to hand kids and say, if we could give this to every single kid, the world would be a better place. So it starts from that like super idealistic place, which then requires a lot of intense introspection, a lot of rigorous thinking and sort of internal argument within ourselves. And then we have to break it down and say, okay, why are people bad at this? Where's the pain point? What do we see happening that we know is not good? What, when we talk to teachers, what do they say? Here's what kids do and what they shouldn't do, and I just can't get them to do it. And so with argumentation, that was kids never use evidence. They don't really have the concept. They have lots of opinions, but they don't ever back them up with evidence, and they don't really understand what evidence is. And so we made that the whole center of, of our game and our immersive experience. And then we took it from a kid's standpoint and said, why is argumentation frustrating and really hard to learn? And it's because it's subjective and because uh, it's really hard to take a piece of language and, and say for sure this is a good argument and this isn't because argumentation is so complex. So let's systematize it and give them a masterable form that's familiar and fun. And let's take that sort of feeling of muddiness and so subjectivity and lack of understanding and complexity and confusion and turn it into something like what turned out to be Pokemon, which is masterable and fun and you feel great and you feel powerful. So how do we contrast those emotions and create something that's really transformative? So I went on for a while. Oh, that was great. (laughs) So that's perfect actually for the next question. You mentioned early prototyping as absolutely critical for bringing a game to life. And that's a common mistake that people make is they don't prototype early enough. So um, how do you, let's dig into that. Um, So let's say now you've done this, which is the, how do you decide which ideas to pursue and which to filter out? You eloquently describe that. So now, now that you've got an idea that's worth pursuing, you maybe test the idea with some teachers, make, find out more about what's hard, et cetera. Great process. Now it's time to do early prototyping. So how do you approach early testing iteration and prototyping on a project once you've decided it's worth pursuing? Oh, yeah. Um, You know, I lean heavily on existing mechanical structures. So it depends on what you're trying to make. If you're trying, most of the time when we're making a game, we are stepping forward something else that we're already familiar with. And so uh, the early prototype can begin with creating uh, the simplest version of that thing that you're going to step forward from. So in our case, if it's Pokemon, we have to isolate what part of that we want to prototype as our core loop. We also kind of design um, deliberately uh, a series of actions the player's going to perform that's no more than three that will be the the core loop, the the verbs that they'll perform inside the game. Um, And then we create 
the the simplest version of that that we can and we put it right in front of players. So a lot of it has to do with um, not letting your eyes get to be too big for your stomach because that's another really common problem is just completely underestimating how complex these games are. Um, and there's an exercise in you know for that that I've heard John Romero give to programmers over and over, which is to remake Pac-Man from start to finish and every single feature. And usually when you think it's done, it's not done because you haven't done the scoring because you haven't done the leaderboard, every single detail. And so um, that, that experience will lead you to appreciate the core loop design process of the game because you'll realize if you really want to execute something well, it has to be really narrow and deep if you're ever going to get to polish it. So you can um, design that, three loop process, which can be based on another game. You can uh, design a, a core loop that's based on Tetris or a core loop that's based on Pokemon or a core loop that's based on even uh, Call of Duty. Isolate what you think the core of that game is and then build uh, a prototype experience that performs that and tries to give you the same feeling that that, that larger experience does. So for those who aren't as familiar with game design, um, talk a little about what you mean by core loop. It's also a term that game designers use in different ways. That's right. Yeah. I, I use that term a lot. Um, it's one of the fundamental um, techniques that I teach people is to build and focus on a core loop. I learned that from game design. Oh. Um, but so what do you mean by a core loop? What's in a core loop? So I so what I think of as a core loop is a... Um, a set of usually three, sometimes four, but no more than four actions that the player will perform uh, in order to, um, as a fundamental interaction of the game. And where this gets tricky and theoretical is, is what you call an interaction, you know? And, and I'll say that one of the, the mistakes that we made with Mars Generation 1 was not digging deep enough on uh, what uh, granularity of verb we were describing as our core loop. So in fact, our core loop implied a massive game. Uh, and, and we didn't see that until we were pretty deep in. So um, for instance, the, we would call the, the core loop in Mars Generation 1 that you first collect evidence and then you uh, equip a robot and then you take that robot into battle. And then once you've done that, you do that over and over again and that's the core of the game. Now, the tricky part about that is that collecting evidence implies an explorable world with evidence that is fun to collect. So there's there are verbs inside of collect evidence, uh, and there are verbs inside of equipping robot, You know, even if they're just drag and drop and select. Um, so you can describe all of your actions in terms of pure verbs and then figure out how many verbs you're talking about. So we, we go from a core loop, which would be that collect evidence, equip robot, battle, over and over again. And then we say, what are the subverbs inside of that? And then expand that loop into a kind of machine. Awesome. So what are your top tips and best practices for somebody listening who really wants to do faster, smarter prototyping and iteration? They're building a game or they're building a game-like product and they really want to be a good prototyper. What are some of the tips you've learned that you wish you knew earlier? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, if I could do it all over again, I think I would look at the major subgenres of games and, you know, basically do a map of the different types of games. Create your own taxonomy for, for video games as a whole and say, you know, there's RTS games and there are storytelling based games like Telltale games. There's World of Warcraft. There's all these different games. Put them into categories and make a prototype of one of each category. Kind of give yourself an assignment. See, I'm going to make an RTS. What is the core of an RTS? Uh, what are the variations in, in RTSs that are out there and what makes them really different? And uh, taking an exist existing game, identifying its core loop, building a new prototype based on that. Eventually taking two core loops and sort of smashing them together and saying, if I was going to take um, an RTS and a storytelling game and break the loops and put back together a loop of three or four actions into a new thing that's a hybrid of both, what would that look like? And what would the most important verb in that be? That's what I would say. That is great. I like that. Have you had much experience with uh, remote or in-person collaboration as you're working on these games? I assume you have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I actually am talking to uh, this 
prestige conference at, um, about speaking about this specifically because uh, at Glass Lab we've worked uh, somewhat with uh, remote staff and my company Sense of Wonder is 100% remote. We actually don't have anybody who's who's sitting next to each other. Mm. Well, it's a really interesting topic for many of the folks that I work with and it's very, very important for if you're working with a team and you're getting to alpha, which is you're going from idea to prototype and beyond. So what are some of the practices and tools for remote team collaboration that you've tried that worked really well? And also, what are some things perhaps you've tried that you went, boy, I'd like to avoid that again. Don't want to make that mistake again. What works and what doesn't for you? Sure. Um, both specific tools and also just overall practices and rituals that you've learned about. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a great question in part because I think a lot of it is not solved. So, uh, as I said, we have a, really a quite virtual team now, um, at Glass Lab, but, and my team is fully remote as a, as a business owner and someone who's a leader in my company, I think a lot about these problems and I mostly right now see the problems and not the solutions. I think you have to work. 10 times as hard to have a sense of company culture. And it's really important to think about what company culture means and how people connect to each other. Because what you're really missing from, uh, from remote is that sort of um, flow state that you can get in when you really know people well. So uh, little things like um, having your team getting to know each other and sharing things about themselves and being vulnerable is extra hard when you're not face to face and you're missing all of those cues. Uh, I think video conferencing is incredibly important and uh, it's hard because especially as programmers don't want to interact over video a lot of the time. And people who are going to tend to want to be remote workers often will resist the idea of video because they actually kind of are more private people. But you have to kind of push your team to say, no, actually, it's really important for us to interact face to face so we can get kind of a sense of uh, of who everybody is in those all of that massive channel of information that we get from facial expression and body language. So um, I think there's a lot of sort of making up that you have to do. And then just uh, knowing what everybody's doing on a day-to-day basis is way easier when you just look over at their desk and say, hey, what are you doing, you know? Or if uh, somebody's having trouble with something, you can actually kind of see it in their body language just by looking at them, whereas when they're remote, you don't know that as well. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what I would say is um, – it amplifies the challenge of project management and uh, amplifies especially, I think maybe more reveals, because I do think that these remote teams are in large part part of the uh, way of the future because it allows people so much more flexibility and so much more quality of life in many ways. Um, it emphasizes that need to see to your team's human needs and needs for a connection which they may or may not even articulate. Are there any particular communication tools that you've settled on? Or are you still trying out different ones? Um, we're pretty settled on Slack. Uh, we haven't gotten it as as beefed up as we would like. I would, actually, I would really like to do more with the bots on Slack and to be playful about things. Uh, and then we use all the Google tools, Google Documents, which integrate pretty well with, with Slack also. Um, and Google Hangout, I wish there was a better video conferencing option because it can be kind of um, kind of spotty, but uh, that we use every day also. Great. So what is your particular superpower as a designer, your sweet spot? Um, well, you know, I, I think I'm beginning to sort of unify my personal message in that I just have this inescapable impulse to try to right wrongs in the world. and so. I, I suspect that it will always be a thread in my work uh, in the future, that there's an activist component to it, that there's a uh, work that interacts with the world very directly and is not about escaping from it necessarily. I think escapism is fine, but it's not the direction that my career is going into. It's, it's products that actually provoke people to think about their world and to think about their own lives and their humanity and their own well-being and, and sort of actualization and all those fancy hippie words. Um, and I think that what I've become is something of a synthesizer, which is to take, uh, the engagement and the stuff that's really magical about games and to bring it together with that sense of actualization. So if you can play uh, an RPG that makes you change the way you think about your relationships with other people. That to me is like the super powerful experience that unlocks the power of RPGs. Because I think games, because they are, are so 
um, reflective of the player and so respectful of the player. Games, games love us because we are the reason why they exist, the relationship between the game and the player. The, the player gives the game meaning. And so the weakness of that is that it can put you in this bubble, you know, where the game is all that matters and you are all that matters to the game and we have this like weird um, codependent relationship that's sealed off from the rest of the world. And so I think by bridging games into the real world and saying, no, actually, game, I'm going to be like a reflection of the world around me and I'm going to maybe have some social critique, you know, Grand Theft Auto does this, and make you think about the world around you and how you might change your behavior based on the patterns that we are reflecting to you as the game, then all of a sudden the game itself becomes healthier and more powerful and we become healthier and more powerful. So I think that's, that's my path. And um, ultimately, it also comes down to respecting and appreciating games as this very unique, very new way of, of doing that reflection on systems because they're dynamic and they're moving every second. And they're systems in and of themselves, models that represent our sort of ontology of the way the world works. So what is your focus these days? That was beautiful, by the way. <laughs> um, What's your focus these days? What's on the horizon? What's coming up for you? Are there any URLs that you can share for folks who'd like to learn more? Um, you know, they should definitely go check out glasslabgames.org. Great. Uh, as a, the work that I'm doing continues with that. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Griffiness. I'm usually posting about stuff on it's U-R-Y-P-H-O-N-E-S-S. Uh, the work that we're doing with Sense of Wonder is still pretty um, in an incubation stage. I will say that my focus, uh, so Sense of Wonder, we you know we picked that term because it was this um, 1970s science fiction term for what it is that science fiction makes you feel, which is this sense of wonder and uh, a sense of the possible, and that's that is the idea that unifies our company. And we're all kind of um, science fiction geeks and uh, science geeks, so I will we would like to be building games that convey that sense of the magical that exists in the real world, largely through science uh, in um, simulations and systems based games that are highly emotional. So uh, we're very interested in conservation and ecological simulations. And uh, again, in those games that take pressing issues and reflect them back through simulations to make players think about how they might interact with the world and if they continue interacting with the world the way they, they have been, what happens? If they were to change how they interact with the world, what would change? Uh, and, and that's what we're very interested in. Great. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing your perspective and wisdom and stories with us today. Sure. Thanks very much for having me, listening to the ramble. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening to Getting to Alpha with Amy Jo Kim, the shows that help you innovate faster and smarter. Be sure to check out our website, gettingtoalpha.com. That's getting2alpha.com for more great resources and podcast episodes.